Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Sizzling Summer Series, sponsored by the UNMC College of Public Health Office of Public Health Practice. Thank you so much to our partners on this series, the Midwestern Public Health Training Center, Wichita State University, and especially today for bringing us our speaker, the College for Public Health and Social Justice at St. Louis University. On behalf of all of our partners in the Midwestern Public Health Training Center, we welcome you. My name is Katie Brandert. I am the Manager for Workforce Development and Leadership Programs in the Office of Public Health Practice at UNMC, and my colleagues and I in this office are, are your hosts for the series. This summer series is focused on exploring what it will take to become an anti-racist public health workforce and public health system. Over the months of June, July, and August, we are hosting this five-part series. You are here today for session four, Empathy, Privilege, and Cultural Humility. Before I turn it over to our speaker, a few logistics for us today. We have a number of participants on the call. We're glad to have you here. And we ask that you keep yourself muted until um, there might be some time near the end for some questions and answers. If you do have any questions throughout for the speaker, I will be monitoring the chat box during the call. So feel free to, uh, to put them in there. If you experience any technical difficulties throughout the call today, please feel free to send me a private message, Katie Brandert for support. And we are recording today's webinar and the slides from today will be posted. The slides and the session uh, recordings for sessions one, two, and three are all available online now. And I'll make sure to put that information in the chat box shortly. Both the recordings and the slides from today will also be made available online following the call on both the UNMC Office of Public Health Practice and the Midwestern Public Health Training Center websites. Finally, but maybe most importantly, a link to the evaluation will follow today's call. Evaluation data will be used to inform the content for the final call of our series for quality improvement overall on our education and training out of the training center and for reporting purposes to our funders. So we thank you in advance for your feedback. Our speaker today is the wonderful Jewel Stafford. Ms. Stafford serves as the Assistant Dean of the Office of Field Education and the Director of the Racial Equity Fellowship Program. She has more than 15 years of practice and research experience working with diverse communities. Her career has focused on training, research coordination, and program planning. Jewel has managed and implemented community-based initiatives that address racial inequities, she's promoted partnerships and improved health outcomes, and she continues to collaborate with local, national, and international organizations on these kinds of initiatives and to develop culturally appropriate tools and interventions that address racial inequities. She serves on the board of Missouri's Teen Pregnancy and Prevention Partnership, on Faith Communities United Executive Committee, and on Planned Parenthood of St. Louis's Community Advisory Board. At the Brown School, where she is housed, Ms. Stafford teaches social policy analysis and evaluation, human behavior and the social environment, and foundation seminar courses. Jewel, we are so lucky to have you with us today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and I'm going to hand it off to you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all for having me. I am super excited to talk about um, Empathy, privilege, and cultural humility. I think it embodies all of the things that I've been doing um, since I became um, a social worker, my work in public health, um, and even now at uh, the Brown School. Let's get into what I really want us to have conversations around today. And that is really to just have a little bit more awareness and understanding of cultural humility. Um, we talk a lot about cultural competence. We've spoken, I'm sure, a lot about racial equity in this past environment and even anti-racism. Um, but cultural humility gives us three really strong pillars to really grasp with why empathy and privilege are also integrated concepts in today's conversation. Um, I really want us to also think about our ways of being leaders through empathy and privilege having transformative conversations and some challenging conversations about equity. And finally, to really think about tools and practices that will help us address health inequities, learning lessons from the past and even learning lessons from our current situation is key. And then what are those challenges um, giving emerging opportunities for? 
right? So I definitely believe that every challenge gives birth to or provides us with an opportunity to learn to do something different. So how do we build a community of practice and support while addressing community um, cultural humility? So I do this all the time, but um, just really thinking about how we wanna establish our community norms, um, just thinking a little bit more about how we wanna extend respect to each other and to ourselves in this space, listening actively and attentively, stepping in, stepping back, stepping back in again, stepping back again. Um, I'm super excited that Katie is going to be um, helping me with the chat. Um, usually I'm a one woman show, so this is super exciting for me. So thank you for that. Um, let's connect to the content first and then think about how we can center our learning through that perspective. Critiquing ideas, but not people. Um, and then assuming positive intent. Um, that seems to be something that I have definitely been struggling with for the past, um, I'd wanna say five months, what are we in June? Yeah, so about five months, um, just some of the things that have been passing um, through the airwaves and through media, I have just been questioning. So I'm really trying to move into a curious space and not so much into a uh, critical space. So I am, I'm challenging you all to help me with that as well. Um, and I'm extending that opportunity also. A little bit of background and context. I am originally from New York, born and raised in Brooklyn. Then my family moved to the suburbs. I went to Stony Brook University. It is a state university of New York. And I went there for my undergrad, I went there for grad, I worked there, I became involved in public health there. I learned about um, residential segregation and how it impacts um, marginalized community, especially in a place like New York, where it's largely known for its affluence. And a place like Long Island is largely known for its affluence. And so much of what I studied in New York in terms of how residential segregation and housing policies on Long Island, New York, um, impacted health outcomes is what brought me to St. Louis. And so that work is where um, we're gonna sort of pick up today. And so I was really shocked when I came to St. Louis and learning all about the intricacies and the historical context about St. Louis, that it actually had a lot of things in common with New York. It was one of the most segregated um, cities. It had been influenced by a lot of historical um, injustices. And um, people were very uh, informative, I'll say that. They were very informative with me about places I should go, places I should live, things that I should do. And I really thought that it was phenomenal in how constructed our reality was from that particular frame. And so how much of what we know and how much of what we think and how much of what we um, perceive about our community, our lives and ourselves are through this construct. And so, so much of that is what I, I wanna get into today. So when I start my conversations around um, cultural humility, empathy, privilege, I wanna figure out how we got here. So what is the story that we've been telling ourselves? How did the story get framed? Um, so for many of us, when we think about the story of who we are as um, US citizens, it's told from a story of adventure. It's told from the lens of conquering. It's told um, from the hero's journey, right? That the hero is making his way and making his mark into the world and landed upon America. And oh my goodness, what an amazing story that is. And so from that lens, 
right? We have aligned our history. We've aligned our stories. We've aligned our narratives around who we are as citizens through this sort of rugged individualism that anyone, if they work hard enough, if they achieve what they need to, um, they go to the right school, they, um, what is it, our other stories that we've told ourselves about buying homes and getting the right education, that you too can achieve the American dream. And that's great depending on whose perspective you're telling that story from. And so traditional approaches to teaching and learning history allows some of us to put that present responsibility of harm that was done to communities in really sacred, buried places. And in order for us to really understand what's contributing to what we're thinking about right now is these health inequities, we've really got to tell the story from the perspective of the people who not just felt like they were on the hero's journey, but from the perspective of the people who also experienced harm and trauma from that. And so how do we tell the story about Thanksgiving? How do we tell the story about 1619? How do we tell the story about the Civil War and what it really was about? How do we tell the story about the war on drugs and the war on poverty? How do we tell the story about voting rights and who got to vote and who got to vote 50 years later beyond that? How can we tell the truth without assigning blame, without assigning guilt, without assigning shame, but just holding it up as an examination of things that happened in our past? And so when the lion does not get to tell the story, the hunter will. And so much of the perspective of what we've learned about our history, about what we've learned about public health, about what we've learned about research, about what we've learned about how communities have formed, have been from a different perspective. And so what would the lion say? if they were telling their story? Would they say I was minding my business in the Serengeti? And then all of a sudden, this person appeared out of nowhere? What would their perspective be? Um, what is the story of your family? Are they telling this the story from the perspective of the lion or the perspective of the hunter? And so this brings us back to a really important and critical um, thing that happens a lot in the works that we do is how are we describing the problem? So, so much of what my lens is, is are we describing the problem from a strength perspective? Are we describing it from a deficit lens? So much of what we need to do in our grants, in um, when we're writing papers, all of our sort of academic institutional documentation has us tell the story from a deficit lens. And it's not a bad thing. It's just how we frame the story that it is of need or that it is of deficit. And what would it feel like if we really sort of uplifted and emerged and really held on tight to the assets that were going on in our communities? How does the media, community organizations, institutions, and stakeholders describe the problem? What are some of those factors that are contributing to the issues that we're not thinking about? Um, I ask my students all the time to think about who's missing. Who's missing from the table? When we're telling the story, when we're trying to solve the problem, who's missing? And who benefits from the outcome? Who benefits from the chaos? Who's benefiting from the situation looking the way that it currently does? Um, what's needed? what capacity, skills, or knowledge are needed to address a particular problem? And then how can we develop an action plan that's collaborative, that's sustainable, that builds an infrastructure to do things that one or two of us couldn't do alone, that we would have to do together? Um, and so that is why I appreciate the conversation around empathy and privilege. I think this, these past two years, have been an opportunity for us to really rethink how we've thought about other people, other people's experiences, the ability and the capacity to understand and share the feelings of others. Um, 
And then for us to think about how we have amassed unearned or unacknowledged advantages, right? So empathy is really the capacity to put oneself into someone else's shoes and to feel what they've been going through. Um, it's the recognition, the validation of someone's fear, their anxiety, their pain, their worry. Um, before we got on this call, Katie and I were having this really interesting conversation about Simone Biles and her ability to withdraw from the Olympic game events because you know, in a moment, her brain and her body did not connect. And she was in the air, not knowing whether she was upside down or whether she was on the ground. She didn't even know she was in the air and how scary that moment was for us. And for any of us who've ever experienced fear or anxiety, or you've had that dream where you're, you think you're falling, but you're not falling, right? Immediately, you can relate to that. Like, whoa, I can't even imagine how scary that must have felt for her, right? And so how much more does it, how much more does poverty scare some of our communities? How much more does violence scare some of our communities? How much more does not being able to care for your family, right? Put people in positions where they feel desperation. Can we tap into that? And if we can't, then where are we that we can figure out how to get closer and closer to that? And so I wanna do an exercise just for a quick second. Um, feel free to populate this in the chat. But when you see these symbols, what comes up for you? Any of these symbols, what's coming up for you? If you said hunger, I feel you. If you said running, I feel you. Katie, I am unable yeah. to see. Uh, let me, I was gonna say, I can read some of these off to you if you'd like. Totally. Um, the MAGA hat equals hate, um, international, uh, intolerance, money, politics, capitalism, mm. name, brand, mm -hmm. uh, racism, privilege, mm -hmm. big business, um, Nike colonization from the West and sweatshop labor mm. root causes. I think I got, I was going scrolling fast, but I think I got a number of them. <laughs> That is fantastic. Um, so for so many of you, you could be talking about any of these symbols. And really where I'm getting that, where I'm going to with this, and thank you all for sharing. Um, I do believe it's courageous to share. So thank you for that. I was in a webinar, I was in a webinar, and Tim Wise, who is a great sociologist, um, did this with us. and. One of the things that he talked about was that the rule of seven in marketing is simply stating that it takes an average of seven interactions with your brand before the purchase takes place. So you could be using, I don't know, um, Scott bath tissue or uh, maybe Angel Soft, but by the seventh Charmin commercial with the bears, right? I know we've all seen those bears dancing around. Um, by your seventh interaction with that um, product or your seventh McDonald's commercial, you start to think to yourself, maybe I do want Charmin. Maybe I do want Cottonelle. Maybe I do want some French fries. I mean, yes, I'm on Weight Watchers, but if I see one more French fry commercial, I'm going to just start frying potatoes just for the love of it, right? And so it is likely, because this is researched, by the way, that once we gain a certain familiarity with a certain product, with a certain brand, that we start building a certain level of confidence and a certain level of comfortability with that brand. And we start thinking that it's good enough and we start believing the narratives around it, right? And so how much more have we learned about other people, other communities, other races, other stereotypes through similar types of marketing? 
Think about every morning when all you want to see is the weather. How are some of these symbols and socialized messages permeating our actual TV, right? How are they coding language to give us socialized messages around certain communities that are safe, certain places that are affluent, certain places or people or um, objects that make us feel fear, right? So much of that is generated in the socialization, the media, the narratives of, um, of the world in which we live. And that's why language is super important. And that is why images are super important because if they can get us to buy Nike after seven times and they can get us to look at the Olympics after seven times or changing our brand of toilet tissue, how much more will it take for us to unpack the socialized messages around gender, race, ability? Um, so that is why it's super important to understand the cognition around some of those things. So thank you for participating with me in that exercise. So the lens of um, systemic oppression, which comes from the National Equity Project also breaks this down into really interesting ways. And it talks about how our individual um, beliefs and our actions, they serve to perpetuate oppression or dismantle it right, depending on how we view the world. And so our interaction, right, with people based on how we have been socialized to believe um, about their ability, about their capacity, about understanding who they are and what they can do, right, that also influences how we engage with them. And then that then influences the types of policies that we create that open doors and closes doors based on what we think people have the ability or capacity to do. And so how is this showing up in our world? How is this showing up in our relationships? How is this showing up with our colleagues? Well, it shows up individually through implicit or explicit bias, through stereotype threat, through internalizing some of those messages and really trying to compensate for not being that stereotype. Um, so I identify as a um, Black female, but my parents are immigrants. And I walk into many conversations around what it means to be a citizen, who gets to determine what it means to be a citizen, how being a citizen is considered the right way. What is the right way to be a citizen in this country? when the story we told ourselves initially, right, was that we had a pioneer who just was doing his hero's journey and he landed in America. But let's unpack that a little bit. There were indigenous people here. He didn't find it. People already existed here. They lived here. So are we saying Christopher Columbus technically wasn't a citizen? Right. So thinking about how we unpack some of these stories we tell ourselves, it gets us to question what we're really saying and unpacking what we're saying is who belongs, who doesn't belong, who deserves to be here, who doesn't deserve to be here. And some of those things are just biased in the narratives and the stories that we've been told about what it means to be a citizen, what it means to be a woman what it means to be educated, what it means to be a public health practitioner or professional, right? All of these things are messages that we internalize. And then what ends up happening is we sometimes then move into these interpersonal sort of relationships, not necessarily asking questions, not necessarily being curious, but sometimes being a little critical. And that's when we start moving into these socialized narratives and creating microaggressions and racist interactions and sort of transferring um, the oppression. And then there are these biased policies and practices that we engage in that are just policies because we've been taught that some people need to be policed and contained and socially controlled, and some people don't. Um, and we, we're bumping into to these tensions constantly. And how do we really understand some of this in a way that allows us to restore the humanity of who we really are? 
Um, and so let's think about some of the policies that we've had around health, some of the policies that we've had around school. Um, some of the things that are completely normalized for me that were never normalized for my parents, right? And so just thinking about some of those things. So when I think about countries who've had to really grapple and struggle um, with how to do the push and pull of haves and have nots and who deserves and who doesn't deserve, I, I think back to South Africa. It's not perfect. They haven't completely resolved, but what they started with was this question, which was, how are we thinking about our collective humanity so that when we have the privilege and we're sitting at the table, then I can think about the people who aren't, and then I can be empathetic, right, to the experiences of people who I may not necessarily be aligned with or that I'm necessarily um, can relate to immediately, but how can I be a great ally or how can I be a great advocate if I don't practice that empathy muscle? And so in Africa, there's the concept known as Ubuntu. It's this profound sense that we are only human through the humanities of others, right? And that we can only accomplish anything in this world if it is an equal measure to, due to the work and the achievement of others. So as you rise, I rise. But when you fall, I fall, right? I am only as strong, I am only as healthy, I am only as capable as my community. And I say my, and I say our, because it is a collective. And so I saw an example of this that I thought I wanted to share with you all today. Um, Drexel is getting a new center on racism and they had a new center director, but the name that they chose was the Ubuntu Center for Racism, Global Movements and Population Health Equity, right? They put it in the name so that they would not forget why they're there. The mission, the vision, the goal is in the name. And they said, it's a radical act of solidarity rooted in shared humanity with unapologetic truth-telling and a commitment to bold collective action that dismantles oppressive systems, disrupts some of these narratives we've been speaking about today, and dares to imagine and build the just and equitable world we all deserve. And that name connects us to a long lineage of transformative social movements, locally, nationally, and globally, from which we draw strength and insights and inspiration. How cool, right? Just an opportunity to, to provide a simple example. So why do we need this approach in public health? Well, we're having increasingly diverse populations, locally, nationally, globally. We talked about capitalism. Someone talked about um, uh, capitalism and things that are that some of those symbols bring up. And health inequities are being experienced by many groups. And we as public health professionals, as um, educators, as social workers, we are being held more and more responsible for some of these outcomes. We're being held more responsible in terms of um, how our money is being allocated and distributed, how the processes that are, are coming down, what kind of research or evidence-based practice is happening. Um, and we're really trying to address the unique needs of unique people and unique populations. And really, finally, we're just really trying to tailor and develop culturally appropriate interventions whenever possible. So you all know the dance, right? That when public health is working really well, we don't even know it exists, right? So I'm drinking clean water, I'm putting on my seat belt, I'm stopping at my signs, I have vaccinations and immunizations, I'm not thinking about things like polio or smallpox or um, measles or chicken pox, right? When public health is doing its thing and it's working well, it's primarily invisible. And when there's a gap like we're currently experiencing now, people try to get in your lane and they try to explain things to you that people have been spending hours 
years decades studying, right? And so I love when people, um, especially on social media, I don't know if you all are on Facebook or on Twitter, but some of these conversations are not even grounded in fact. And so how do we challenge um, some of, and demystify some of these things that are happening that aren't true when people are primarily believing things that are not um, based in facts. How do we do that? Well, let's try to have a little bit more empathy about, about it, right? So I happen to be in a world where I know about public health. I've studied public health. I believe public health. Um, the church I go to, they also have public health practitioners. They have people who work in the health field. Um, they give us webinars about um, public health. My friends happen to be educators. They also are public health educators. Who knew? I have friends in the health department. My social network is pretty much like a Dr. Fauci family reunion, right? So I am constantly swimming in this. That's my world. I'm a goldfish swimming in public health water. But what if you're not that way? What if your family and your friends and your social networks and your church and the people who you trust do believe some of the things that we're hearing, do believe some of the myths that we're hearing, do believe that. How do you convince them that that is not true? Well, we could do what we've been doing on social media. That could work, yes, but it hasn't been effective because what we're really, what we're really trying to build is a muscle in people's confidence to make informed decisions. And if their world, if their group of people, if their network are not in conversation with us, and if all we're doing is calling each other names and not listening to what's behind some of those stories and those fears, we can't break through to each other. And so, so many of the conversations that I've had with people who don't live in my world have just been around like, well, what are you scared about? What is, what's your fear? What do you think is going to happen to you? Okay, let's talk about this. All right, where else have you seen this? Okay, let's, let's have a conversation about this. I'm not trying to convince you, right? Because I'm not selling you a car and I'm not selling you a, um, I'm not on an infomercial trying to sell you something. My job is to plant a seed that allows you to make informed decisions. I believe in self-determination. I believe in choice. And I believe that these are the things that people want to have for themselves. And so empathy integrates the concept of patient-centered care, knowing that these social and cultural influences are impacting the way they see us, the way they see our institutions, the way they trust us, the way they distrust us. All of those things are key to that. And I am empathetic about not trusting institutions that were designed to help me, right? That that is where some of that fear is coming from. That's where that, that's what we're tapping into. And so taking the, the view of others may require us to question our own views and values. It may involve suspending, even momentarily, our own beliefs, leaving them up to challenge, and for, for some of us, particularly for those who crave certainty or feel threatened by change, this can be way too much to demand. Have you ever tried to convince your grandmother to change her recipe on any of her meals? I dare you. I dare you to tell her to use Splenda instead of brown sugar. I tried. It doesn't work. Right? We are set in some of the ways that we do things. And so what are some strategies that we can use to enhance partnerships, build relationships, build collaborations? And some of that comes from being curious and not critical. So what's necessary for the treatment, for the intervention, for the program to occur? How are our communities thinking about defining and even weighing the risks the costs and the benefits. 
what are some of those risk factors and what are some of those protective factors, right? So if my family and my network is my protective factor, sometimes the messages that I'm receiving may be risk to me feeling alienated or isolated or outside of that, right? What have my previous experiences around healthcare taught me? How have I been treated when I've gone to healthcare organizations or healthcare institutions? How have I been treated when people are telling me to go to pharmacies, right? So my previous experiences build on that as well. So I know this has been generating a lot of conversation and when it comes to empathy and privilege and cultural humility, our vaccination conversation is right there at the center of it. It is right there because so much of us really believe if all you had was the facts, if all you had was education, then you would know that all you need to do is just get a vaccine and you'll be fine. Okay, you won't be fine, but you won't experience the deleterious effects of COVID. You won't have to be hospitalized, right? It's just that easy. Just tell them. Just let them know. Why can't we just share that information? How hard could it be? Well, the data is telling us that data doesn't only produce social change. Education doesn't only produce social change. Behavior change is hard. And we have to be empathetic to that, right? And we have to be empathetic to the fact that some of us are privileged enough to digest this information and get it quickly. And some of us are still struggling with it and need to digest it in different ways, right? So I am on Weight Watchers in perpetuity. <laughs> I don't know why. It is a great program. I understand everything I need to know about my BMI. And I know in theory that all I need is to put myself in a caloric deficit and go to the gym. What do you think are some things that are helping me struggle? What do you think are some barriers? What do you think are some things that are preventing me from just eating healthy and losing weight? I'm on Weight Watchers. Well, from personal experience, my mom makes a really good pasta and it's hard oh. to tell her no. There goes that social network again. How am I supposed to tell mama no when I go over Sunday dinner? Anything so, else? Anyone yeah, someone else said family. Family, absolutely. Anything else? What too else busy. could prevent me? Uh, too busy, time. Comfort, Time. comfort, stress, culture, culture. Absolutely. Right. And so when we see people who are struggling with obesity, right, do we just tell them, don't, don't some of us just say, well, all you need to do is get on a caloric deficit. You, if you're on TikTok, that is what they say all the time. Oh, many of you don't know what a caloric deficit is. What it really means is you just have to reduce your calories. Oh, many of you all don't know what kind of exercise to do, but what's driving my motivation to even engage in that, right? If I'm talking theory of change here, am I even motivated? Am I even contemplating this? The same is true for so many of our community members when it comes to, and we've been through this, right? When it comes to tobacco, when it comes to um obesity interventions. And the vaccine approach isn't any different. We're working with conflicting messages. We're not really sure. We're feeling ambiguous. We don't really know. Um, and so how do we engage in telling the story when people are trying to make it seem as though all you need to do is get the vaccine? Now we're hearing about breakthrough infections. How do we tell that story? Well, if you're an employer and you want people to come back to work, what kind of story do you think you're telling? I'll read what shows up in the chat box here. Thank you. So yeah, if you are an employer, you're probably saying things like, if you get a vaccine, you'll probably be protected and your symptoms will be mild. 
anyone had a cold recently or flu recently or explain to someone what it was like giving childbirth? What is mild? It's subjective. And so what empathy does is it pulls us out of this subjective approach. It pulls us out of this um, this place where we're weaponizing our jargon and it allows us to listen to people's stories. It allows us to hear what people are actually saying. I am scared. I don't know. And I don't trust this. We have always been there. How do we work with people to expose and transform and move beyond that? So Brene Brown talks a lot about daring leadership and daring greatly. Um, but I was watching a, if maybe it wasn't a TED talk, maybe it was a YouTube um, conversation. And she was having this conversation about having the conversations that make you feel uncomfortable or not having those conversations rather is the definition of privilege. Your comfort our comfort, my comfort is not at the center of this discussion. That's not how this works. It's not a question of whether I have a bias or not. I, I have biases. It's a question of how many, how bad, and how deep. And we have to choose courage over comfort. We've got to be able to say, look, I don't know if I'm going to get this right, but I know I'm going to try because it's what I'm not going to do is just stay quiet. And so how many of us are willing to have those types of conversations? So today, as we're moving into the next part of our um, sizzling series, organizing for change has some processes and some practices. One, it's telling the story. Two, it's strategizing. And we've talked a little bit about telling the stories and the stories we've been told. We're gonna to move a little into strategizing, acting, building relationships and how to structure teams. But looking at the big picture, it's understanding who has the locus of control, who has the power to make the decision, who's concentrating on the resources at the right time and in the right place. And so this is near and dear to all of our hearts, I hope that health equity is achieved when every person has the opportunity to attain their full potential, their full health potential. And no one's disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of their social positioning or other social determined circumstances that health inequities are reflected in the outcomes that are different in life, quality of life, rates of disease, disability, death, severity, disease, the severity of disease and access to treatment. So many of us know, many of us have endorsed the social determinants of health and moving beyond the midstream. For many of my colleagues or maybe many of my um, non-public health professionals, I usually talk to them about, you know, what would what would you do if you see a baby just floating down the Mississippi River, right? And they all will say, well, I'll just jump into the Mississippi River and I'll grab the baby. And I said, great. Now, if you see 10 more, what will you do? And they said, well, I will just get a bigger boat and I'll do that. And I said, great. You're now downstream. You're doing some downstream work, right? You're doing sort of like the, the one, the two, the three, the four. But when Will you eventually ask the most inevitable question, which is, what's the most inevitable question? How are these babies getting in this water? How does babies get in this water? What, what is happening here? Babies don't just start floating down. Hello. Hello, who's right? So <laughs> who's opening the gate? So I'm going to go upstream and I want to figure out what is happening, right? And that's when I'm going to my strategies. That's when I'm going to my laws, my policies, my regulations, and trying to figure out who's opening the doors and who's closing these doors. Because we got to close this door. We can't have babies just floating down the river, right? And so many of us have been taught when we think about health inequities to blame the people or communities that are experiencing that and not to ask the bigger question, which is what is allowing this level of inequity to thrive? 
not survive, not exist, not even emerge, but to thrive and grow in ways that we can't even see. It's so insidious that every time we try to pull something back, it almost reconfigures itself like a conveyor belt, right? It's like whack-a-mole. I try to hit one and then another one comes up and I try to hit one and another one comes up. And that's because we're not going upstream. And so what are these laws and regulations that are creating community conditions that are supporting or not supporting health of all people? So let's play some chess, right? My mentor always tells me, in times of crisis, you are either a chess player or you are a hockey player. Today, I got called on the carpet for being a hockey player um, because that's my, that's my dominant hand, right? My dominant hand is if I see something, I'm going in, I want to fix it, I want to figure out what's happening. But in social change, sometimes it's super relevant, it's super important to just be patient and to not move with the sense of urgency, but to really play a little bit of chess and think. What are my values around this? What's being brought up for me around this? What am I centering when I make decisions? Am I centering my own fear, my own processes, my own organization, my own bottom line? Or am I centering the needs of the communities who anchor me? And what can I contribute? And what can I give? And if I can't give, when will I know what I can give at that appropriate time? And so let's talk a little bit about common language that seems to be moving around us in this atmosphere lately. So there's diversity. There is the differences, right, in social identity, race, gender, cultural, um, gender expression, ethnicity, race, political affiliation. There is inclusion, ensuring that those with diverse backgrounds have a voice or contribute or engage. There's cultural competency where I spend a lot of my days doing a lot of cultural competency trainings and thinking about the ability to interact with individuals of different cultures respectfully and effectively. And then recently with my students, I said, you know, before you hop into racial equity, let's talk a little bit about cultural humility. This perspective that involves us being lifelong learners, engaging in some self-reflection and critique, recognizing the dynamics of power and privilege, and being comfortable with not knowing. Now, I have to tell you, at the Brown School, we are knowers. We are knowers. We are curious, but we, we pride ourselves on being knowers. At SLU, we are knowers. We have a whole institution that are built on Jesuit knowers, right? Like we are knowers, we know it, we got it. We have plans and research strategies, we have this. So what's the problem? Why can't we just do it? If we know it, we have it, we've done it before. Why is it so hard? What's getting in our way? Why can't I just add water and stir like it's Aunt Jemima pancakes? What's standing in my way? We've got um, behavior change. Mm -hmm. um, Aunt Jemima. <laughs> Ego. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I love. Um, since the uh, pandemic, I've been using HelloFresh. It's this, this interesting thing that I've been doing. And um, another friend has been doing it. And she has a different approach to cooking than I do. It's very different. Um, I've been cooking since I've nine, right? So my level of comfort around the kitchen is very different than my friends. So when she gets the HelloFresh recipe, she uses all the materials. She follows the recipe to the T. She uses the cup. She uses the foot. She gets the measuring tools. 
She does exactly what they do, frame by frame, picture by picture. She is a recipe follower. How do you think I cook? No measurements. <laughs> Somebody said, not like that. <laughs> no, I do not. <laughs> Intuitively. I, I, when they give me too many potatoes, that means I'm having hash browns for breakfast, right? Sometimes I don't even want the onions. I'm going to use that for another recipe. Some of my meals come out to three meals because I'm using the carrots for this recipe. And I'm like, nah, I don't really want to do that here. And nah, I don't want to really do that there. Right now, I want you to think about the first time you ever learned about a research intervention and how you first practiced it, right? You were like, okay, I am going to meet with the community and I am going to ask some questions. I have my interview pad and I've got my questions together, right? The first time you do anything that's new, right? You want to make sure you get it right. Cultural humility is asking you to flex a different muscle, right? That I want you to be in relationship. I want you to feel a little comfortable. In fact, if you make a mistake, that's okay. It's how you learn, right? And so cultural humility is testing almost the ethos of how we've been trained. Um, and it's it feels a little uncomfortable, right? So when my friend is telling me that her meal turned out perfectly, I'm like, great, I have three meals. They taste good to me. I'm satisfied. It works for me in my process. And so the process of committing to an ongoing relationship with patients, communities, colleagues, it's a, it's a process, right? And we're not fixated on the outcome. We're really just trying to avoid the expert trap. We're trying to dismantle some of these assumptions and stereotypes. We're seeking to understand people on their terms, which is sort of a little bit different than being right, being perfect, um, not wanting to make a mistake and not wanting to sort of show up in my authentic self. And so my purpose today is to really Think about how we do that in the work that we do, that when we're trying to convince someone, are we trying to be in a relationship with them? Are we building sustainable relationships that are co-learning, that are bi-directional, that I'm learning as much from them as they are from me, that we are engaged in a collaborative process? Or am I trying to be right? Am I trying to get the, the answer right? And so that's the difference between moving from cultural competence to cultural humility is that I'm not trying to work towards competence in learning about different populations. I don't wanna be competent in Api culture. I wanna have relationship with my Api friends. I wanna build a level and a muscle to address and recognize some of these power imbalances. I wanna be an ally. I wanna be a strong ally. I wanna be able to bring some of them into the room. I want to be a transformative, solidary agent, right? These are the things that I'm, I'm looking for. And so when I'm aiming towards collaboration and understanding, that comes over more and that helps us to think more about the process and not so much the outcome. And so critical self-reflection means I'm going to become a lifelong learner. I'm never going to assume that I know everything there is to know about not only my, I'm, first of all, I am still learning myself. I am surprised in this pandemic, the things I've learned about myself and I know me, right? So if I'm still learning about myself and I'm still learning about my motivation and I'm still learning about my own ability and motivation to change, how much more am I supposed to be investing in other people? How much more grace am I supposed to be giving people, right? So these are things that are really important. And when I get into that process, it allows me to give more grace to others and it allows me to be a little bit more empathetic to my students who are struggling, to my family members who are struggling, to community members who are struggling. Um, and then it allows me to recognize the power imbalance. Quick story. So I'm minding my business, which isn't something I do very well. You should know this about me. And 
my colleague and I, we are walking into the garage. We both drove our cars there. That is definitely a privilege. We both parked our cars. Again, we had a parking pass. That is also a privilege for us. And um, we get to the door and I just open it. And my colleague has a cane. She has her hands full. And I just open the door and just walk through. Because we're having a conversation. I'm not even thinking about it. I'm just like, all right, I'll just open the door. So I open the door. And before the door hits her, she stops the door with her cane. Because the door doesn't go forward. The door actually swings out. And she goes, you know, had you not been here, I wouldn't have been able to get through this door. Now, yes. You almost hit me and I accept your apology because I, I had to apologize profusely because I move in, in sometimes in those ways that I don't even observe what's going on. I'm just opening the door because I can. I am able-bodied. I didn't have anything in my hands. I was able to go there, right? And she said, you know, had we not been having this conversation and had we not been here, I wouldn't have been able to open that door. I don't know what I would have done. There's no elevator here. There's not even an escalator here. And I said, oh my gosh, that is, that is so true. I hadn't, I'd never thought of it that way. And so for all of the times that I think about racial equity and I've had this narrative of what I could and I couldn't do, I never thought about the fact that I could just easily open up a door, walk through it and not even consider my friend who I know and I love and who I was having a conversation with that quickly privilege did just completely did not, I didn't have a, a, it was just a gap that quickly. And I use that example to think to myself, how many other ways have I engaged in this way of just opening the door? Like the door is just open to me that I'm just privileged to be able to read the instructions in my language or able to drive because I'm able to have a car, right? Like how am I able to recognize that that privilege exists. Now, how am I able to become an equitable agency for my colleagues? So the first thing we did was we talked to our institution and said, hey, you know, if you're parking on this floor, if you have a disability, you can't open the door. There's no elevator on that floor. So what are we gonna do about parking for people who have disabilities, right? Like, do we just say they don't park on that floor, right? So immediately because I recognize my friend was impacted and now I have a relationship with her. I'm now holding my institutional. I'm now engaging my institution in accountability. I said my apology and she trusts me and she knew. But how do I hold my institution accountable so that people who are like my friend can now walk through that door or roll through that door um, or take the elevator or find places to park? Right. So, again, as much as I do this work, I am still checking my own gaps and checking the fact that my dominant hands in the places where I'm privileged, I just walk through the door. I do not think about it. And so when my friends who have that same privilege walk through the door and leave me behind, if we're in relationship, I tell them, I said, hey, you know, I need an ally in that meeting and here are the 16 things I need you to do, right? And so how are we opening doors and denying privilege, um, de denying opportunities um, for people who don't have that privilege? And so finally, when we're talking a little bit about cultural humility, it's through dialogue, through conflict recovery, through this problem solving, right, that I am showing respect and I'm showing understanding for all the different ways that I am privileged and all the different ways that I can leverage that privilege to be an ally to those who do not fit in that social identity, whatever it may be. Um, and I have grace and I ask people for grace for me and I ask for accountability and I ask people to hold me accountable. My students, they tell me all the time when I have a gap in my understanding, right? And I can tell you lots of stories where I may have said something that was harmful or I had to check a gap. But, 
you know, all of those things came from relationships because they trusted me enough to share that information with me and let me know that those things were happening, right? And so all of these things right here are ways in which that we can think about cultural humility, right? Are we observing attentively? Are we assuming complexity? Um, what are some things that we're not assuming and who's missing? What are some of those personal observations? Um, are we tolerating ambiguity or uncertainty? I got to tell you, this right here is such a muscle um, for tolerating levels of uncertainty, especially when we just want the answer. And so why is this important? Why do we need to view the community as the expert? I'm sure for the people who are watching the webinar, they're gonna be like, why does she keep asking questions? <laughs> I think folks are typing in the chat now. Okay. Or if there's a person or two that wanna raise their hand, you can also come off mute. One person said, without them, we can't move forward um, because they know their lives best. It's their story because we don't know it all. We need other perspectives. They are the experts. They are the experts. And so that's absolutely true. So how do we do it, right? How do we do this work? Because it's easy to talk about it in a webinar. It's so easy to talk about, read about in a book. Um, but I want you to think about the last argument you had and where you were sitting and where your cortisol levels were sitting and how even ridiculous the argument was now that you think back about it. Like, why were we even arguing about this? Um, right, just think back about that. Were we able to skill up and have the difficult conversation? And so I heard something really important the other day, which was we can't hold people accountable if we don't give them the skills to engage in the work. Right. So if I don't skill up my team, if I don't skill up my students to have the difficult conversation, to wrestle with the ambiguity, to sit in the discomfort, to listen to people tell you how wrong you are and how wrong your institutions are. If I don't skill up that particular muscle, then I can't hold them accountable because they don't have the skills. Right. So I love to think about our developmental stages of learning. And um, my dad would always tell me this story. Um, he's he's um, passed away two years now, but he always used to tell me this story about my level of tenacity, even when I didn't have skill. And so we had this day where he was going to teach me how to um, tie my shoelaces. <laughs> and I was three, maybe, maybe two and a half, like a good two and a half. And I saw someone do it on TV. So I put on a shoe and I tried and I tried and I tried and I tried to tie my own shoelaces. I don't know. I still do stuff like this to this day. And he sat there and he said, do you need help? And I said, no, I'm grown. I'm a big girl. I can do this myself. What are you doing? Get away from me. Um, and he said, well, I can teach you about the, the bunny ears and teach you how to tie your shoelaces. And I was like, no, daddy, I can do it. I got this. And he said, okay. And he said, all right, look, mm -hmm. I'm going to sit over here, read this newspaper. When you're done, come and ask me for help. And I said, okay, convinced I could do it. You all know the answer to this story. I couldn't do it. I had to go and ask my dad for help, right? So when our communities are coming to us and they're asking us for help, the assumption isn't that they haven't tried. They didn't try to figure it out. They didn't have options. What we need to figure out is how to be open and flexible and recognize that they are asking us for help and what a position that puts them in and what a position that puts us in and how to negotiate that power and balance and how to be kind and compassionate in that space, right? And so engaging and being willing to explore acceptable compromises, not going up and down about the like, read this or go here. Why are you here? How can I help? 
What happened to you? Asking some of these questions are ways in which we honor the expertise of our community. So I'm gonna move fairly quickly because I think we have a half an hour left. Um, cultural humility in public health is really putting on a critical lens to understanding the issues that have impacted specific groups. So what are those social determinants of health that are impacting them? And understand how the role of certain policies and even just our SDOHs have created and perpetuated some of these outcomes that we're seeing in our communities. And in our role, in our privileged position to be public health practitioners, how do we stand in the gap? How do we repair the breach that has been committed by things that happen beyond their control? How do we improve the health and the well being of populations that are most impacted? If that's what we said we want to do, then how do we do that? So here's something I love this elephant for two reasons. One, it's pretty much how we have conversations, right? So if I'm a researcher, I'm gonna say it's research. If I'm a public health practitioner, I'm gonna say it's practice. If I am a student, I'm gonna say it's theory, right? So we all, from our perspective, look at a specific entity outcome and we're super tunnel vision, right? We're looking at it from sort of this myopic, point of view. And what cultural humility allows us to do is sort of step back and see the elephant for its entire beauty and majesty, right? And say, oh my goodness, it's an elephant with a trunk and um, a body and some ears. And, you know, look at how beautiful this elephant is. But if I'm only here, I'm only going to see the breath, and I'm only going to see the fan. So sometimes I have to think about what's my perspective and where, literally, where am I sitting um, when the big elephant is in the room? The second reason why I appreciate this um, graphic is um, Dr. Kira um, Hudson Banks from St. Louis University always talks about privilege with this idea that there's the elephant and that there's the mouse. And then when we are the elephant, we see the world through opportunities. We see the world through a different level of perspective than when we are the mouse. And then when I am the mouse and I am near an elephant, I am only thinking about survival. I am only thinking about how to make sure that I'm safe. I have to study the elephant to make sure that I can live. And so for many of the people who are marginalized and for many of the people who are experiencing systemic oppression, they have studied what privilege is. They have studied what it means to be in that space so that they can survive and eventually just be able to, um, have a, a different level of health and well being. Does that make sense? Right? So, when I'm thinking of empathy and when I'm thinking of this graphic, I'm thinking about how careful the mouse has to be around the elephant and how probably sometimes unaware the elephant is around the mouse, right? They're not looking down, they're looking up and they have lots of reason to. They're huge, they're big, they, they're majestic, they're amazing. Um, but when we're talking about inequities, sometimes we're talking about critical survival skills around an amazing amount of privilege. And so when I'm faced with that, I have some questions that I need to consider. What are the deeply held socially constructed values or beliefs in the US and how are they presented and how are they experienced? Right, so how am I internalizing some of those socially constructed messages around what it means to be a professional, what it means to be in this gender, what it means to have this religious belief, right? What are some of those deeply held things that I may not say out loud, but I believe them. And when someone comes in opposition to that, how am I engaging in that difference? How am I managing those differences? 
What do you believe is a fair distribution of resources and rights? There's a lot of conversation around people who aren't vaccinating, having the right, I don't know if you've heard this or not, having the right to utilize healthcare um, resources if they're not willing to get vaccinated. Have you all heard this recently? So I've heard this from a number of people and I've been curious as to where this is coming from. Katie, have you heard this? I'm not sure if anyone in the chat has. Yeah, somebody said that, yes, they have. Right, and so for many of us who are engaged in this work, we wouldn't turn away smokers from getting treatment. We wouldn't turn away people who've experienced obesity from going to hospitals. Why do we think, right, that we can hold these sort of constructed values and beliefs around people who have, constructed values and beliefs, right? That we start trying to open doors and close doors around resources and rights, right? Like where are these false narratives coming from um, that would create an intentional disadvantage for someone else, right? And so I've been hearing that and I've just been curious as to how people think that that is, that is okay. But then when I think back, I think back to, our socially constructed ideas around poverty. I think about our socially constructed ideas around homelessness. I think about our social constructed ideas around food security and food insecurity and who is food secure and who's food insecure, right? That COVID-19 demonstrated that we have a huge food insecurity problem in the country. I didn't know that that existed, but look at some of those socially constructed ideas and policies, right? Where, where have I thought about, how have I thought about um, social security, um, child welfare, right? All of these socially constructed ideas of haves and have nots deserving and undeserving, quote unquote, deserving and undeserving population. And what I want us to consider, what I'd like to consider for your, um, what I'd like to submit for your consideration today is that part of the social construction is a means of social control. So I know you will have seen this many, many times, but I want us to think back to Flint, Michigan. And I want us to think back to some of the things that we hold dear in public health about clean running water, that that is one of the things that we've always held dear, that we've, I mean, everyone who took epidemiology, right? We all know about Jon Snow and the water pump. We've been there, right? We've gone through this. And so in today's world, how is something like Flint, Michigan allowed to just happen with lead in the water for as long as it did? And how is it that we weren't able to recognize and empathize with what we know as public health professionals to be true? That when lead gets into the water, that the outcomes won't happen in that moment. It won't happen, you won't see it right then and there, that there's gonna be a cognitive delay for years and years to come. How do we know? Because we dealt with this before. We've, that's one of our public health milestones. We've done this, right? We've, we've done environmental justice. We've done environmental health. Our health department exists for this. We test for lead and water because of this. We are fully aware of what this means. But when we're thinking about equality versus equity, we have socially constructed ideas and values and beliefs about communities, Right, We have socially constructed values and beliefs about fair distribution of resources. And so equality is like, well, you know, you get some and I get some. Equity is people who really need some of the resources um, the most, the, the most impacted people should get the resources, right? And so how are we thinking about that in terms of what we're seeing today? And so some of those 
barriers to us doing the work is just by, again, those assumptions, those myths, some of those stereotypes, right? Thinking back to the symbols that we saw, how we're socialized around thinking about certain people and we don't invest in the shared humanity of it all, right? Generalizations, right? So in research, generalizations are amazing, but when we are really doing equity work and anti-racism work, generalizations can sometimes be a barrier and we just have to consider that. Oppression. We talked a little bit about that as well. And so, so much of what we know about culture, um, and this is why we're moving away from cultural competence and really sliding into cultural humility, is sort of the surface level stuff, right? We know about that 10% and we know about um, sort of the, the things that are super um, Netflix special, Anthony Bourdain, right? The things that are around our cultures, food and dance, and maybe even clothing. But what's really driving health outcomes are all of these different things here. How am I considering behavior change? What am I thinking about when it comes to my relationships with animals, my courtship practices? What does my culture think around justice and incentives to work? Who am I thinking are my leaders? How do we engage in decision-making? What's considered clean and what's considered a de dependent? This one right here is what always um, elicits a lot of great information is what is your theory of disease? How do you think you even got sick, right? How are we thinking about friendship? How are we thinking about the hierarchy of our elders? All of these deep cultural things that are 90% of what's driving my healthcare decisions are nowhere to be found sometimes on the assessments. How do you know what I'm drinking and I'm really eating? How do you know what I'm reaching for in my cupboard, right? So again, I come from an immigrant family I'm going to say about 90% of the time, if my dad is going to the doctor or my mom's going to the doctor, it's because she's tried just about everything underneath here. And if you asked her if she's taking any medication, she'll tell you no. She's not taking any medication. It's not medication. She doesn't consider it medication. And so how do we tap into that when we're thinking about that? Um, and so here are just some questions. I like to ask questions as opposed to just giving calls to action. I don't like to just prescribe, but thinking about what comes up for you when you respond, when you're interacting with new people or how you respond to people from different cultures. How do you deal with feelings of anxiety and discomfort? Can you even talk about anxiety and discomfort in your safe space, in your brave space, right? So I have... Lots of students now who are super brave and they will talk about their experiences. But when I was growing up, I was not allowed to talk about mental health. I wasn't allowed to talk about anxiety or discomfort. We had a grit culture, right? I am generation X, right? Like you had to get it together. That was it. Like you came home when the lights came on, you, you know, you didn't cry. You had sort of this gritty, really sort of like get it together. If you don't do it, you have the weight of the world on your shoulders. You are doing this not just for you. You're doing it for your family, right? What are some of those messages we've heard so that when people are telling us we they have anxiety or they're feeling uncomfortable, are we secretly judging them because of how we were raised and the things that we were socially constructed to believe? Again, if that is how we're thinking about it, then how do we think about Simone Biles saying, this is too much for me, I'm gonna, or Naomi Osaka saying, I wanna honor my mental health. Are we secretly judging Olympians because they said, I'm gonna honor my mental health in this decision, right? So again, those socially constructed pieces and how are we managing um, some of these power imbalances. What strategies are you using to gain clarification that will enhance communication with others, right? So are you sharing with people what works for you or do you admonish 
or call people out, right? Because we have a call out culture. So are you calling people out? Are you calling them names? Are you canceling them? Are you shutting them down when they are saying probably the wrong thing or they're still learning or maybe they said something that was a microaggression? Do you just label them and walk away? Or do you say, hey, I just got to tell you, the way that that came across, it kind of hit me differently than I thought it would. And let me explain to you what I mean, right? Do you help them understand what works for you? And then how do you support or help others understand your similarities or differences? A simple, I don't agree with that can sometimes be helpful or help me understand what's going on there or you know, not how did this happen? We're moving more into trauma-informed language and starting to talk about, well, what happened to you, right? Just pulling out and eliciting some things for conversation. So one of the best tools I've learned for moving conversations forward is the c Lyra method. Um, I practice this a lot. I ask my friends to practice this with me and I ask my students to practice this with me as well. And I say, I'm going to give you on a index card, a statement or a phrase that really offends me. And I need you to work with me through it so that when it happens, I can be prepared. Not that I'm caught off guard and then I can tell you about yourself. So (laughs) I say I slide the piece of paper over. They say it to me and I practice. I crack my neck. And I'm getting ready because it's practice. And I check my pulse and I take a deep breath. And I listen to what the other person is saying. Now, mind you, I'm handing this to them. So I really trust this person. And I affirm some component of what they're saying because I really want to be empathetic. And I really want to trust that the person who I'm having this conversation with, because you can't have it with everyone, but I'm trusting that the person that I'm having this conversation with, that I can trust them with what I'm about to say. I can trust them with the conversation. And I know that their intentions aren't to set me up for failure, right? So I don't have this sort of diabolical Avengers, you know, um, you know, Avengers unite because now the world's at the edge. No, I want to affirm what they're saying. I'm going to respond, not react to what was said. And I'm going to add to the response in a way that moves the conversation forward. These are things that we have to practice because the people who give us the biggest microaggression sometimes aren't strangers. They're people who we trust. They're our employees. They're the people who work for us. They're people in communities. They're people who are hurting and hurt people hurt people. And so I need to check my pulse, right? I was a case manager for about three or four years right after I graduated um, from Stony Brook. And I had a patient who would call me the N-word whenever her medications were off. It was terrible. And I would go to my supervisor and I would say to them, I don't know if I can work with this person. And they said, Jewel, our resources are low. We don't know if you can not work with this person. Um, So what do you need to continue to work with this person? I said, I can't have them calling me the M word. That's not going to work for me. And they said, well, have you told your client? And I said, no, because everyone knows that's ridiculous. Why would I engage with you when you're being outrightly, explicitly racist? She goes, okay. Before we take her off the caseload, can you have a conversation with her? I was like, I'm in my early 20s. I barely know if I have a prefrontal context, p- cortex that's working at this point. And I really want to keep my job. So I'm engaging in this conversation and not saying that any of you have to engage in this conversation, but I'm really just using this as an example for something that I had to learn about myself, not about the client, not about the work, but about myself. And I said to my client, I said, look, I don't like it when you call me that name. It's really offensive. It's deeply offensive to people who look like me. And let me tell you why. And I know that you're probably off your meds. And these are all the things that I go through a litany of things. 
And I said, but if you want to continue working with me, we can no longer have you calling. I cannot work with you if you call me that name. That is my boundary. I appreciate you, but I can't continue to work with you if you continue to call me that name. Remarkably, right? She was like, no one's ever told me that before. I said, how could no one ever tell you that before? She said, well, you're the first Black person I've ever worked with. And that's what all my friends have called them. Okay, I didn't see that going that way. Okay, well, here's the thing. Anyone who looks like me, that is not what we like to be called. And from this point on, let's never call anyone that again. You cannot call me that name again. That was really hurtful to me. And I was telling my supervisor that I didn't want to work with you anymore because of that. She was like, you were going to stop working with me because of a name? I said, yes, because it's a big name. It hurts me deeply, right? And so when I think back to what I'm asking people to have in those conversations, I'm not asking you to do this with neo-Nazis, white supremacists, I'm asking you to do this conversations with people that you have relationship with because the expectation was that I thought I would never work with this person again. I ended up working with them. They understood what was what's the big deal. I don't know if I would have continued to move in that organization had I not tried that approach. And so when I am having these conversations with people now and when those things happen now and when people are engaging in microaggressions, I choose courage over comfort. I've had more practice with it. I am not saying that I am perfect at it. I'm not even saying that that is the best example. What I'm saying is that in order for me to do the work that I'm doing, I know that people don't see the world that I, the way that I do. And if I want to engage them in a reciprocal relationship, I have to choose the relationship sometimes rather than being right. And that leadership and accountability account for sustainable change. And that when people know that I'm the type of person to tell you what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling, they trust me a little bit more. Right? Do you trust people who are willing to talk behind your back or people who are going to bring it to you as uncomfortable as it may be? And so we build on the strengths. We know the community. We know what works. We work with them to figure out what works with them in their community because it's a shared responsibility. And so how are we able to engage in high level action oriented change? that is inducing the critical analysis of culture and ways of being in the world that allow us to understand why people see the way that they see the world the way that they do. It entails us becoming a little bit more skilled. I have to skill up. I have to ask for help. I have to understand that change doesn't happen overnight. It's an awareness, it's a knowledge, it's a skill base. It's the same way I think about understanding odds ratios. Whew, that almost took me down this semester. Jewel. Yes. I am enjoying this so much. I lost track of time and it is 2.33. Oh my gosh, I'm leaving. So change requires <laughs> different choices, different decisions, different actions new effort, new relationships, new habits. And so the last quote that I want to leave you with is, we will never go back to normal. Normal never was. Our pre-corona existence was not normal other than we normalized greed, inequity, exhaustion, depletion, extraction, disconnection, confusion, and rage. We should not long to return, my friends, we are given the opportunity to stitch a new garment, one that fits all of humanity and nature. And so let's use this challenge as an opportunity to do something we've never done before. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening for my long, ridiculous stories. I appreciate you so much um, and hope that this was helpful in some way, shape or form. Jewel, thank you. Thank you so much. For the sake of time, I'm going to close us. And then if you have a few minutes and anybody has questions, can they stay on and ask them? All right. So thank you, everyone, uh, for attending Sizzling Summer Series Session 4. 
Our next session is, Oct is August 12th, 10 a.m. It is session five, Approaching Practice with an Anti-Racist Lens. I had an opportunity to see some of the materials from our three panelists that are joining us for that call. It's going to be a very fantastic call. It's going to bring together all of the concepts that we've been talking about all summer. I hope to see you all there. A link to the registration is being put into the chat box right now. So if you have not yet registered for session five, please join us. Once again, thank you so much, Jewel, for joining us today and for sharing your expertise, your stories, your humor, uh, and your knowledge with us. Really, really appreciate it. And thank you everyone on the call for completing the evaluation, which will be sent sometime in the next couple of days. And from all of us at the Midwestern Public Health Training Center, we will see you August 12th. Take care, everybody. And Jewel, do you have, did you say you do, or do you have a few moments if anybody has any questions? Okay. I do, I have, I'm here in case anyone has any questions. Thank you. Um, and so if anybody, if you're here and you have a question, you can put, put, raise your hand up on your reactions or you can also um, just come off mute. It's a smaller group now. So we'll see if there's any questions. I'm sorry, I didn't keep better track of time. I was just- I am, engaged. you know what? I am such a storyteller. <laughs> I just go into telling stories and then I just keep going and going and going. Um, and I was like, oh, I'm surprised I have time for this case management story, but I'll do, I'll tell it because <laughs> it's super interesting to me. <laughs> Hello, hello. I'll ask, I'll ask a question. And it's more because I just really appreciated your delivery and stories. Um, and so I'm curious to know your personal take on this. Totally. Um, and so I, Katie and I used to work together and have done lots of great work. And, um, and I will, I'll put this in the evaluation also, but like, we've actually like had Melanie Turbon do like all sorts of workshops. And this is still my favorite presentation on cultural humility ever, 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 ever. Um, so, so thank good you. Um, <laughs> and um, so I'm just curious to know if you have any tips, um, a person personal area of growth for me um, this year has been struggling to figure out how to bring some of this approach to um, like the uber anti-COVID. <laughs> um, like I have less grace. Yes. Um, and so I'm just curious to know what tips, if you have any tips or how you have found a way to use some of this. Cause I, I feel like we, as public health, as a field, yep. um, we have not found a way to bring yep. our listening ears, um, in this moment. Yeah. I, I, yeah, that has been like the number one question. Um, my students have it. I have a friend who does this like on social media. Um, and it really just comes from listening. Um, so much of what's behind the resistance is not only fear, but just misinformation. And so just saying like, you know, I, I hear you. What I hear is that you don't trust that the vaccine will protect you and you're seeing all of these things. So what will work for you? Right. So how will you protect yourself um, and understanding that my conversation is not the thing that's going to change them, right, that it's going to be the experience. But I can have the conversation and I can say, hey, look, you want to continue to have conversations about this. There's some things that I am totally resistant to, but I'm I'm willing to help you build confidence in your decision making. I'm not trying to convince you to do anything. So whether or not you get the vaccine, my only concern is that you're healthy and that you don't get sick. And so what are you going to do to protect yourself? And so much of this language, I think I learned from the HIV epidemic, right? So like, you know, no, COVID isn't a sexually transmitted disease, but I remember just how much fear and how much stigma right, was a surrounding people. And so what they decided to do is just say like, all right, look, it's not about you. It's about me taking universal precautions. And so they stopped moving from risk reduction to harm reduction, right? And then they said things like, well, what will you do to be safe, right? And 
you know, we, we have to ha- we have to meet them where they are because they're somewhere shaken in fear. And this armored approach is to protect them from something. And maybe I'm not the one that's going to reach out to them, but maybe I'll plant one seed that will grow. And that's what I'm building. Um, and so I do the same with my students. I don't think I have to take in 15 weeks of whatever class I teach them that they're going to wake up and be like, magical. <laughs> but I'm hoping that something in what I say touches them in a way that gets to how will you, I'm really concerned about you getting sick. And quite frankly, I want to make sure that you're safe and that you are taking care of yourself. So how are you doing that? Are you wearing a mask? You know, do you have health insurance? You know, how are you planning to take care of yourself? And I think some of those conversations um, bring down the temperature a little bit and not talk about the policies and the politicalness, because I think sometimes that is where they want to go. And you just remove all of that and say, well, how are you going to protect yourself? At the end of the day. How do you protect yourself from the flu? How do you protect yourself from the cold? How do you protect yourself from car accidents? Okay, so you have a process. Okay, I'm just checking. (laughs) Now, if they're my kid, right? If they're my niece and my nephew, my perspective is different. But if you're a grown adult that's making decisions for yourself and you choose to engage in certain behaviors. Again, as a public health professional, I'm not tied to the outcome, right? I I want you to be safe and I want you to do these things, but I also believe in primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. Not everybody gets it on the education. Sometimes people get it on the screening. Not everybody gets it on the screening. Sometimes they get it after they get the disease and they're like, whoa, right? And so that's why we have such an expansive role when it comes to that. We have an an amazing toolbox. And so, you know, the hammer doesn't necessarily work with everybody. Sometimes you need a screwdriver, a flathead. So I would say, don't give up, just keep having the conversation, but it's hard because their world is not our world, right? I have Katie, I have you, I've got Pameline, I've got Yoon, I've got, I have everyone here who's my choir. Everyone sings the same song that I sing. Y'all are my choir. And it hurt me to the core. I'll sing back up any day to you, Jewel. <laughs> I'll be your backup singer any day. But, but think of, but Katie and I were just having this conversation about how heartbroken we were when we lost a little confidence in the CDC, right? When they shifted everything we knew, like we were, we were like, Elizabeth, this is the big one. How is the CDC doing this to us, right? And so even we have to step back sometimes and say, Oh my goodness. Um, Oh, primary, secondary, tertiary statement. Um, It's like the first thing I learned in public health. So your primary prevention is your knowledge. So um, if we're talking about cancer, right? It's educating you on cancer and how to prevent getting cancer, whether it's HPV, smoking, um, when it comes to lung cancer. And then you have your secondary levels, right? So that's when you get your screening. So our secondary levels of prevention is why we get mammograms. It's why we go for pap smears. Um, It's the screening to make sure that whatever activities or public health activities, whatever activities we've been engaging in, that we didn't put ourselves at risk. So we have the screening um, for that. But the tertiary is, Now that I have a positive diagnosis of cancer, now I'm in the phase of getting treated for that cancer. Um, And so that's when I'm doing the chemotherapy and the radiation. And I eventually go through that course of treatment. I'm in remission. And now I keep going back for tests, but that's my tertiary level. And so when I think about public health, um, one of the greatest tiers we have is we get to, we have points of intervention. So if education doesn't work, 
we still do the screening. And if you test positive for something, we still have the resources to treat you, which is why I was so confused when people were saying, well, if you don't get the vaccine, then we shouldn't treat you. Cause I'm like, we don't do that with people who get lung cancer. And we don't do that with people who are obese and end up with cardiovascular disease or diabetes, right? We know that certain behaviors are going to lead to certain things. So we uh-huh. don't stop treating you because of it. Okay, and I, and I heard the phrase, do you understand what I'm saying through the mask? Yes. And I heard the phrase primary, secondary, and tertiary, tertiary what? Oh, prevention. That, prevention. See, I, I love that. I love the idea of it. And um, I wanted to capture it. So thank you very much. You're oh, welcome. And, I, and I'm a storyteller too. So <laughs> I was like transfixed. I was like, dang, there's two of us in the world. <laughs> ah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Um, Everyone who is still here, Jewel said you, you are free to Google her and connect with her. Yeah. I did ask her that before the call and now I'm glad I did. So uh-huh. um, feel free to, to Google stock Jewel and, and follow up with her um, following today's call. If you have any other questions, is that still true, Jewel? That is still true. I I answer my emails. I'm on LinkedIn. I think I'm still on Facebook. Um, See, see, Uh -uh, uh-uh, (laughs) uh-uh. We have to learn so many of these TikTokers. And, I know. And, and Twitters. I used to tell people, uh, here I go with a story. I used to tell people that I have a Twitter account, but I, I can't find it. And so once I find it, I'll tweet you. But, and now I, now I can do those things. But, yes. you know, thank you so much for being available. Thank you um, for listening and being present. I appreciate you. I mean, I know Zoom is hard. It is a, uh-uh. a very different environment to learn. Um, so I try to tell stories and make it a little bit more engaging than just reading off of the slides. So that's, that's great. Thank you. you guys. Thank you. you guys, I'm a converted extrovert on. I love this. I don't, I don't ever want to get in my car and go to another meeting. <laughs> I, I want to have you. it right here, like, right now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh my oh. goodness. And well, Jewel, Jewel, don't, don't let me, let me tell you something. I've been a Toastmaster since 1980 and mm-hmm. I'll be finished. I'm sorry, Katie. I've Ooh. been a toast. I've been a Toastmaster since 1980. And the one thing we do not do is we do not thank the people for listening because when you're presenting to us, oh. my sister, mm-hmm. you're presenting to us, you are gifting us with what you have. Oh, so oh, we have are, never heard that. Oh, yes, ma'am. And, and in the chat, I said, thank you for those precious jewels <laughs> you shared with us. Thank and you. that is a cardinal rule. Okay, Katie, okay. I'm going to mute myself. I appreciate that. I'm going to take away from that. That is why I love these. You always like, I'm always learning. I am a lifelong learner. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Awesome. And thank you everybody for, for sticking around and feel free to Google Jewel and follow up with her. And I hope to see you all August 12th, 10 a.m. Thank you. Thank you everyone.